we're going to present the Asina awardees. There are three of them. Uh, first one is Jürgen Braunstein. He's the winner of the 2022 Asina Award in the category Junior Principal Investigator. He's a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and is supported by the Edwin Schrödinger Fellowship of the Austrian Science Fund. We will hear from him later. Let me just introduce the two other um, awardees. It's Sabine Heitzneder. We briefly heard from her now during the, the panel discussion. She's the winner of the 2022 Asina Award in the category Young Scientist Award. She's an instructor at the Cancer, cancer Immunology... Immunolo sorry, I can't speak anymore. Immunolo immunology and Immunotherapy Program of the Stanford Cancer Center Institute. Sorry for that. And Niklas Tech, now he... Uh, is the other winner of the 2022 Asina Award in the category Young Scientist. He's working under the Erwin Schrödinger Fellowship of the Austrian Science Fund to research quantum chaos, harmonic analysis, analysis and lattices first at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We'll start with Jürgen Braunstein, who cannot be here with us today, but he sent us a video message, which should be coming up any moment. We really should have prepared the drum roll. One key mechanism for strengthening trust in science and democracy is through transparency. Transparency is also a critical element in effective financial public management. And the lack in transparency is a major public policy issue surrounding sovereign wealth funds. Sovereign wealth funds are large state-owned investment funds which can be found almost everywhere in the world. These funds are very large. For example, the Norwegian fund is approximately with one trillion US dollars the largest fund in the world and owns on average 1.5 percent of every listed company in the world. Many of these funds like the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority are also very opaque and this has frequently raised questions about the motivation are the investments driven by economic logic or by politics? Related to this is a much more fundamental issue of why states create such funds in first instance and why some states don't. There are a number of theories out there making sense of this variety, but they cannot explain all. For example, why do we see very different funds in countries with very similar macroeconomic characteristics? Or why we see very similar sovereign wealth funds in countries with very different macroeconomic characteristics? Or why do some countries with very large surpluses and reserves like Switzerland consistently don't opt for the creation of a sovereign wealth fund, while other countries with very little surpluses and reasons to create a fund, create a fund, for instance, Turkey. In my research, I try to shed light onto those questions by bringing in transparency into the black box of sovereign wealth fund creation and the policymaking processes. Policy-making processes are structured in very different ways across countries, allowing for different actors to be represented and sometimes even over-represented. So together, these characteristics shaping the logic of policy and the mandate of the fund. I developed a framework which allows us to make sense of this variety and who benefits from it and who does not. And thereby, I hope to shed light on the understanding of government financial institutions and opening a new perspective 
and I hope to foster greater government accountability by offering a window into government processes and facilitating thereby a better informed public debate. Next up is uh, Sabine Heitzneder, whose field I have obviously struggled to pronounce, but uh, she's going to explain it much better than I could do. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Oftentimes in medicine, the solutions aren't simple. That was the statement Peter Nagele made this morning, and I have to say, Peter, I absolutely agree with you. So even though I'm not going to dance my science project today, even though I totally could, um, I hope that I can inspire you guys today um, in joining me to be excited about the potential of adoptive cell therapy, um, and that you will also join me and appreciate um, how much of a challenge it actually is to bring those uh, promising um, therapies to patients. So, let's see how we can get this started. That is not my presentation yet, so I might still have to dance in order to keep you guys engaged. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. So, survival rates for kids with high-risk solid tumors and brain tumors has not significantly increased in the last 40 years. To just give you one example, um, Ewing sarcoma is a rare childhood bone cancer for which um, between the 70s and the 90s, we improved the survival rate of about 17%. However, ever since then, we have been absolutely stagnant. And this is not because we aren't treating these patients with um, intensive enough uh, therapies yet. Actually, we've already hit a plateau, um, and the therapies that these kids get are so uh, dose intensive that up to 20% of those kids that survive end up developing a secondary cancer during their life. So that means because we treated cancer number one, they end up developing cancer number two sometime in their lifetime. So clearly, we need um, targeted therapies, and there's a huge unmet need um, for targeting cancer cells specific and not targeting normal tissues in the body. So how can we do this? One approach that facilitates this is called immunotherapy. And it's where we hack a patient's own immune system and equip it with receptors so that those receptors then target the tumor cells in the body but leave the healthy cells completely untouched. So here, um, as said, we take T cells out of the patient's own um, blood circulation. With a gene transfer, we equip them with a receptor. So we turn them into a CAR T cell or a chimerican antigen receptor. Then we infuse those cells back into the body um, of the patient where they go find the tumor cells, lyse the tumor cells in a specific manner. Um, and this approach is called CAR T cell therapy. So I'm going to talk a lot about CAR T cells today. So the most important thing and sort of the holy grail is we need to find proteins that are specifically only expressed on the tumor cells and not on healthy normal tissues. Um, and that is one um, of the main things that we have to tackle here. The potential of cellular immunotherapy has uh, stories and faces. Emily Whitehead was the first patient ever in 2012 in the spring to be treated with this uh, novel type of cell therapy. She was diagnosed with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, had relapsed twice, which meant she was out of uh, other treatment options. Um, and then uh, was treated at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where uh, they had just started a clinical trial with this type of therapy. These cells got her into remission and a year after she um, celebrated her first uh, one year cancer free anniversary. And she kept um, continuing anniversary after anniversary until earlier this year she was designated cured because she celebrated 10 years cancer free. So really um, I think uh, this emphasizes um, how much of a potential we have here using engineered cells in order to treat patients. After Emily, um, multiple other children were involved in this clinical trial. In total, 82% um, experienced a complete remission due to this therapy, meaning that their cancer completely went away. Um, this was designated a breakthrough therapy um, by the FDA, 
and was approved in August 2017 to be accessible uh, for all. And a year later, it was approved in Europe. It also made headlines for numerous other reasons. Number one, it became the first cell therapy um, that was approved for the treatment of cancer. It was the first gene therapy that was approved for the treatment of cancer. And I think this is the most striking news. It had a very unusual developmental path because it was approved in children first. Only less than 10% of drugs that are being developed are actually developed for children. Most of them are developed for adults, and then later on we figure out if this molecular pathway target is also expressed in kids, and then um, you know it's kind of like the, the second line. Um, but I think what this emphasizes is what we can actually do if we focus on um, childhood cancer in the academic space. So now uh, the next huge question uh, that my research uh, was interested in is how do we make this type of treatment work for solid tumors and brain tumors? Because this now had worked in leukemia very well, which is a blood cancer, but how does this work for solid tumors and brain tumors? So um, as mentioned before, the holy grail is to find a protein that is really only on the tumor and not on any other normal tissue in the body. And I found that a protein called GPC2 is actually expressed in the developing brain. Um, so in the fetus, when the brain develops, this protein is, is expressed at high levels, but then it gets shut down at birth. And after birth, it is not expressed anymore in normal healthy cells. So using this um, as a target on the tumor cell, uh, I could utilize this and engineer CAR T cell receptors that could bind uh, GPC2. First, I wanted to understand how many molecules exactly of this protein are on patients' tumor cells. And I figured out that it was about 5,000 molecules per cell by developing um, an, a specific assay for um, this manner. This was important because on, in comparison to tumor cells that we grow in petri dishes in the lab or patient tumor cells that we grow in mice, it was actually much higher and didn't really represent how many molecules per cell were found on the patient tumor cells. So this largely overrepresents uh, what we think is actually there. Only some of them closely resembled what's really on patient tumor cells. So this, to me, um, told me that we re I really need to be careful in which models I um, use for preclinical development of these receptors so that I can really pick the right disease models. Um, so then I engineered CAR T cells. And I figured, uh, I already knew, I need to pick a disease model where the cells um, only have 5,000 molecules of this receptor on the surface. And I also, also thought that probably one of these CAR T cells will uh, need to win the fight against more than one tumor cell. So I challenged my CAR T cells with five times the amount of tumor cells um, in comparison to one CAR T cell. And I found that the receptors I had engineered, they had an anti-tumor effect, um, so that was good but it really wasn't all that strong enough yet. So I made modifications um, to the architecture of these receptors and was then able to increase the potency um, from sort of low to medium. Um, and now they actually did kill the tumor cells under these conditions in a Petri dish. I was really excited to see um, that these receptors were also able to mediate potent anti-tumor effects in animal models. So in comparison to the um, CAR receptors um, number one, um, the novel um, engineered receptors were now able to cure mice that um, were engrafted with these tumors. Then I actually realized that some of these tumors come back. So if you really think about applying this in patients, we don't want that, that to happen, right? So I um, figured that I probably still need to increase the signal strength even more in order to prevent this from happening. So I gave my most uh, potent constructs to this state uh, an additional boost uh, and was then able to show that now these constructs were able to um, really um, mediate strong and sustained uh, complete responses. So in comparison to the first two versions, this version now um, can really mediate uh, long and sustained anti-tumor responses. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is good, it works, it's, uh, it clears the tumor, but is it safe? So the next question was, um, if this shows any sign of on, what we call on target of tumor toxicity. So is it really only killing the tumor or does it have any effect on normal tissues? And despite the strong clearance of the tumor, I actually didn't see any signs of um, toxicity in the tissues of these mice. 
Um, once these receptors are optimized, um, they're actually poised to mediate uh, potent um, effects in um, other types of cancer, not only the ones that it was initially developed for. And the reason is because these fetal antigens that are expressed during development are oftentimes shared between different cancer types. So I realized that GPC2 is actually also expressed on a very common childhood brain tumor, which is called metulloblastoma. So I, I was wondering um, if this therapy could also work in childhood brain tumors. Um, and again, um, my CAR receptors were able to mediate um, potent anti-tumor responses. And the boost version was really able to clear the tumor um, without seeing any recurrence of them. So this is all mice, right? So actually we developed this for humans. So where, do, where does the field stand when it comes to CAR T-cell therapies for childhood brain tumors? And for this reason, I would like to introduce you to um, probably one of the devastating, most of the devastating diseases that is out there. Um, it is called DRPG, or Diffuse Intrinsic Pontine Glioma, uh, or DMG. So it is an aggressive childhood brain tumor that grows in the brain stem or in the spinal cord. Um, it is characterized by a, a mutation, which makes it universally lethal. So that being said, the average life expectancy after diagnosis is about 10 months. Um, and so far, um, in the history of the disease, there hasn't been any um, anti-tumor response or improved prognosis with any drug that's been tested. So this is basically where you tell um, parents that the kid was unfortunately diagnosed with this disease, there's nothing we can do about it, um, and the average life expectancy is 10 months. Um, my colleagues in the lab have figured out that there's a target on these tumor cells, which is called GD2. And we had already been working on CAR T cell receptors that can target GD2. So it was clear that we really needed to try this, and my colleagues at Stanford uh, initiated a phase one clinical trial. Um, and um, I would like to um, tell you one example um, out of the 11 patients that have been treated so far who came in wheelchair-bound, incontinent, and in uncontrollable pain. And after um, about five infusions of these CAR T cells, uh, which was eight months um, after diagnosis, um, presented walking, continent, and without significant pain. And experienced, as you can see um, on these images um, there, that the tumor had shrunk by 99%. So this is quite groundbreaking, right? Because so far in the history of the disease, um, these tumors hadn't responded yet. And the um, radiologists that actually you know, saw these uh, images were like, not quite sure what to write. I've never seen this in the course of my entire career. Uh, so this has been quite uh, groundbreaking. And I think it really emphasizes the type of potential we have in utilizing cell therapies for childhood brain tumors. So now I'm working with the team at Stanford um, and with the colleagues at the National Cancer Institute in translating these CAR T cell receptors that are developed for GPC2 for children um, with solid tumors and brain tumors to be enrolled in a phase one clinical trial, which will open at Stanford next year. So somebody will be patient number one. Um, it comes with a price tag. Um, so just to develop this therapy, so to get uh, the vector to make the products and then to manufacture about 40 um, products for patients is about $4 million, um, which I think, uh, you know, emphasizes um, the type of challenges we face in bringing these types of therapies to patients. Um, it is reflected by the fact that so far, even though it's been, you know, designated a breakthrough therapy and was approved um, by the drug um, authorities in 2017, we still only have one product approved for children. As compared to five other products that um, have ever since then been um, approved for um, adult diseases. And I think this emphasizes the robust, that the robust development of potent and safe cell therapies and also the phase one clinical uh, testing really is a duty of the academic um, arena and needs to happen in university hospitals to show the first efficacy data and then um, get uh, the industry interested. So how does this look currently um, in the US, in Europe? In the US, we have about 50 clinical trials for cell therapies open for kids to enroll in pediatric applications. About 90% of them are academia initiated. So this is where the university um, hospital has um, initiated and sponsored the trial. 
In Europe, even though we have more than twice the amount of people, we only have 11 trials open right now, um, and less of them um, are academia-initiated. So that's about only 15% of what the U.S. is currently doing. Um, as you can imagine, you know, with these types of results, there's a lot of colleagues um, and, you know, people that um, I know from Austria that reach out to me these days that are either, you know, either have a patient or somebody in the family or know someone who knows someone who knows someone who is affected by this um, and curious if and where um, patients can get enrolled um, in these trials. Um, the number of cell therapy trials that are accessible for kids with high-risk childhood cancer in Austria is currently zero. Um, and I hope that this is really a not yet um, and that this type of results will spark some momentum um, and that we will see, uh, see this happening in the future in Austria as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it, I think this emphasizes that it really does take a lot to make these type, um, types of therapies happen. First of all, it needs a lab where you can focus on the preclinical development of these cell therapies, similar to what I did with GPC2. It also requires a uh, department that works on the clinical trial design process development that you know, figures out how to mix, make these products. Um, then it takes um, the hospital team and staff um, who is able to run a phase one clinical trial. And ideally, um, it also entails a correlative science unit where it, then you can learn from the clinical trial and from the data, why did some patients uh, respond and others didn't, and how can we use this information in order to understand how we need to kind of re-engineer the product to increase the number of patients that can um, respond to these therapies. Um, and having these four pillars kind of like under the same roof is really the dream workplace of a translational clinician scientist um, where, you know, you can see your, um, um, your scientific um, efforts really applied all the way through uh, to making it uh, to patient application. Um, so despite, you know, all of the challenges we faced in bringing these, pa uh, these therapies to patients, um, I hope that I've sparked uh, your enthusiasm um, for the huge potential we have um, in cellular immunotherapy, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sabine. Now I'd like to invite uh, Niklas to present his research. Thank you very much uh, for giving kind of introduction. And the mic. Is it better? Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Um, thanks for the nice introduction and the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so am I, ah, perfect. So yes, as already was said, I'm sponsored by the Austrian Science Fund, by Schrodinger Fellowship. Um, and for the next 10 minutes, I would like to uh, accomplish two things. First of all, I should tell you what the title says. So who the hell was Littlewood? What was his problems? And secondly, um, I would like to uh, tell you a bit about uh, what I've been working on in the last, thing, uh, last couple of years. So, uh, with my good collaborator and friend Sam Chow, we've developed some uh, new methods that help us overcome stumbling blocks in the Afantine approximation, and I just want to give you a glimpse of what it is. Um, so, the Afantine approximation is really about making life easier. A lot of times you're faced with um, working with very complicated numbers, very annoying things, you know. You want to know how much wine is in my barrel. And then you look at the barrel, and it has like a you know, circular thing at the bottom, and you ask yourself, uh, what's this area of a circle? And then you're confronted with pi, and pi is really annoying. It's, it's really not that cool as people make it out. It's annoying to compute, and since antiquity, people have tried to do something about it. So this is a very ancient branch of mathematics. It goes back to the Fantas of Alexandria who lived somewhere between 200 before Christ and 200 after Christ, not much is known. Um, and already, you know, the ancient Greeks, the Indians, Babylonians, they all had their own approximation to pi because they wanted to know how much wine is in the barrel, okay? Um, so let's make this a bit more 
abstract, which is useful. So we take a favorite number alpha, which is a nasty number. We want to get rid of it and to replace it by a nice number. Um, and then we, are, you know, we don't want to work with two difficult numbers, so we take fractions, p over q. Um, and you, we want to keep the denominator q to be somewhat small because we don't want to work with a fraction with a denominator a million. Okay? So the name of the game is, look at this formula. You have your number alpha. You want to compute the closest fraction with a given denominator. Okay. So this is an ancient question. Um, so hopefully there is an answer. And yes, there is. So uh, Dirichlet, a German mathematician with a very lengthy name, Johann Peter Gustav Lejeune Dirichlet, um, lived somewhere in the 19th century, and he says, um, OK, no matter what your nasty number is, I can guarantee there is some fraction p over q so that I can do 1 over the denominator square of quality. Um, See if I can go back. Um, can I go back? No. Okay. So you know the significance of this square is actually, if you look at it trivially, uh, so you just take your number, you compute the fraction. What you can certainly assure is one over the denominator, because all of these fractions with the given denominator they're spaced one over denominator apart. 1 over q, 2 over q, 3 over q, so on. So that's their spacing. So 1 over q you can do, but Dirichlet says, ha, I can do 1 over q square. And it's significant, because if your denominator is 1,000, this says the error you make, the trivial error would be 1 over 1,000, but Dirichlet says, OK, you can do 1 over a million, which is much better. Um, and this is not just an answer that Dirichlet provided. It is the optimal answer in that context. So in fact, you cannot do much better. You can take numbers for which this is really the truth. You can just do 1 over denominator squared, at least for infinitely many denominators. And then you need to strategize what the best denominator is, which is a question I don't want to get into in 10 minutes because it's complicated. But that's the right order of magnitude that we know. And then, you know, people thought about this and they said, okay, I can do one number. So if I can do one, maybe I should go on to two. So they took two numbers, alpha and beta, and they said, ah, so what can I say about approximating these two numbers with fractions with the same denominator at the same time? So this is a question. How small can I make this kind of expression, which is on display, with a, different, uh, with a given choice of the denominator q? And by what I just told you, you can apply this theorem of Dirichlet. Um, by the way, theorem is how mathematicians call their findings. It's a bit of strange language, but I'm going to expose you to it. Um, so by that theorem of Dirichlet, you can take your first uh, approximation error, alpha minus p1 over q, and you get a 1 over q square infinitely often. And then for the next guy, you might not be so lucky, so the best you can maybe do is 1 over q. So by what I just told you, for two numbers, you get denominator cubed. That you're guaranteed infinitely often. Um, and this brings us to Littlewood. This is the culprit. So um, Littlewood said, OK, this very simple application of Dirichlet's theorem that I just showed you, this is not the best you can do. There should be something better. So what Littlewood said is no matter what two numbers you choose, alpha and beta, if you fix any kind of small epsilon, so think about one over a million, one over a trillion, whatever small number you fix, um, you write down these two approximation errors, you multiply them, you could also add them, but mathematicians somehow like to multiply them, just out of curiosity, really. Um, so you multiply them, and you ask yourself, can I solve this kind of approximation quality? Can I guarantee this for infinitely many denominators? And this is what Littlewood asked. This is his problem from the 1930s. So it's very innocent. We understand one number, now we're trying to do two. What can we do? Okay. Um, 
And the answer is embarrassing. It's not all that much, really. Um, you know, we really, really lack answers to this. So um, not much is known. And some of the highest prizes in the last years were given to partial results on this. Um, there's no Nobel Prize in mathematics, in case uh, that's of interest to you. But there is a Fields Medal, which is handled as the equivalent. And some of the Fields Medals were given on making progress on these type of questions. So people really care. Um, and yeah, Littlewood, Littlewood was also a very strong mathematician, so he couldn't do it, which is also kind of a warning sign. Um, so, you know, with Sam, Sam and I had a look at this, and we looked at the following variants. So this is what we found. Um, you take any uh, four numbers. So this is a typo, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, oh, I can't give a presentation without a typo. Um, okay, you take your first number, which is not rational, because if, if it's rational, it's, it's just stupid. You don't, it's not interesting. Um, okay, um, and then you look at this little wood type expression. So you multiply the approximation errors, and you ask, can I beat what I get from Dirichlet? Can I beat Dirichlet? Uh, and the thing is, yes, you can. Uh, in fact, the epsilon is, re is replaced by something which is going to zero. So this is a much stronger result in a quantitative sense. But there's a caveat. Otherwise, we would probably get a Fields Medal. Um, and the caveat is, OK, you can fix any three of the numbers. And over the fourth one, you lose somewhat the control what it does. So this beta here is sort of generic. There's some small, exotic, exceptional betas that we cannot handle. But otherwise, it's really answering this conjecture of Littlewood in a strong sense. And the satisfying thing is um, this answers a question of our former bosses. So Viktor Berisnevich, Alan Haynes, and uh, Sandra Villani had asked about this. And we gave a strong, optimal answer, in fact, to this question. Um, so this is all I wanted to tell you. So. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>